Okay, so for the next session, I'm joined by Mohamed Qureshi, um, an assistant professor in systems biology at Columbia University and an expert in the intersection of machine learning and biology. So before we get started, I'll wait for our, wait for our photos to come up on screen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Always strange to start an interview with disembodied voices, but uh, anyway. hello, Mohammed. So I thought, hello, hello. thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. Um, so I thought let's uh, start with one of those intersections. So uh, uh, protein folding. So uh, for the sake of the audience, could you tell us um, what is protein folding and what does machine learning have to do with that? Sure, uh, that's a pretty bad question, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> So, so maybe, maybe even before before asking that answering that question, just say what proteins are. So proteins are essentially sort of the working working machines of the cell. Right? So in any in any cell, um, we have molecules that perform functions like transporting molecules or doing cat catalysis, um, things of that sort. And, and and all those machines are essentially powered by proteins. The proteins are really kind of the building blocks of those machines. Um, now, the way proteins sort of carry their function, at least in part determined by their structure, by what they look like. Uh, so different proteins have different shapes, and that shape essentially kind of determines the, the, the function of those proteins. Um, so protein folding now to your question is sort of this problem that's been going, on, going around for about 50, 60 years, uh, which is asking, you know, can we predict the structure of those proteins, what they look like, uh, essentially based on their amino acid sequence. So on a molecular level, right, a protein is essentially kind of a chain of, of 20 possible amino acids types. Um, and, and it's that sequence that essentially determines the structure. So if we're able to kind of go from the sequence to the structure, we'll, we'll gain tremendous insights into potentially function and, and, and so on. And, and so it's been sort of an open question for a very long time, but there's not been a sort of an easy, simple recipe that describes how that structure comes from sequence. And that's, that's where machine learning comes into play because it sort of potentially allows us to, um, to build a map that goes from that sequence to the structure. So yeah, can you tell us, um, so um, can you tell us like, wh when is it that we'll know potentially a sequence, but we won't know the structure? of a protein, when, when does that come up? Um, all the time, I mean, essentially all the time. <laughs> uh, it, it just so happens that determining the sequence is actually fairly straightforward because that comes from, from the DNA, right? So, so genome sequencing, which has been sort of, a, you know, now it's a well-established technology has been around for decades. That essentially gives us a, a pretty good idea of, of what the protein sequences will be uh, in, a, in a given genome because we can just read them off the DNA. Uh, structure on the other hand requires much more sophisticated experimental techniques that uh, can be very expensive and, and just very labor intensive. So you know, it used to be that, uh, well, you know, probably 30 years ago, it used to be that the single structure could be a Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, until recently, a significant structure could be a PhD. Um, and, and now increasingly, obviously, becoming something almost routine. But, but, but on the experimental side, at least, let's say, it, it does remain a, a, a sort of formidable kind of experimental challenge, at least for certain classes of proteins. OK, so as a super important if you can, as you say, go quickly from sequence to structure. So uh, I think in the title of this talk, we, we mentioned alpha fold. So let's maybe uh, let's talk about that. Like, you know, what was, you know, what is alpha fold? Why is that significant? What was before? What's after? Like, you know, what was the alpha fold event in protein folding prediction? Sure, sure. Um, so like I said, I mean, this, this is the field that's been going on for a long time. You know, it's, it's not something that's new. People, people have been working on this problem for, for decades, really. Um, and, and in fact, it sort of got formalized in, in, in this sort of competition called CASP, uh, which happens every two years, where essentially groups try to predict structures, um, it, try to predict the, the structures of proteins that, that they don't know. So it's sort of a blind prediction task uh, using computational techniques. Um, and I think it's fair to say that for much of the 2010s and, and certainly the 2000s, the field was somewhat stagnant. Not, not much was really happening. Uh, machine learning sort of began to percolate in the space in the mid 2010s as deep learning sort of became, you know, kind of broadly used in computer vision and other areas. Um, but it wasn't until uh, sort of, well, so, so there was certainly a lot of progress, but I, I would say it wasn't until kind of DeepMind's entry with the first alpha fold in 2018 and then the second alpha fold in 2020 uh, that we really saw the, the kind of the, the conceptual innovations materialize into sort of practical improvements. So, so, so I think there were, there were many ideas that, that were sort of floating around. But so DeepMind managed to kind of put them together in a way that was very effective. Uh, and that really, um, I would say, moved the field from being kind of an, an interesting method development exercise, something that, that's of interest to specialists, but not maybe to the broader the biology community and the biomedical community, 
to now, I think, being of sort of fundamental interest uh, to, to, to the biomedical community. So the methods now work well enough that they're actually interesting for people who don't just care about method development. And that was that was reflected in the fact that I believe it was um, Science Magazine that, that picked putting such a prediction as their breakthrough of the year last year across mm -hmm. all the fields of science. Yeah, so, so you mentioned now that, you know, potentially the, uh, the performance of uh, the uh, structure prediction is sort of good enough that it's, you know, it's no longer about the methods. It's like, okay, that, well, now we can apply it. It's like, now what do we do with this? So I guess the question is, so what, what is, what has that opened up? What is the new level of performance opened up that we weren't able to consider before? Well, it, it's actually, it's almost hard to say because it's such a broad, you know, I certainly wouldn't have expected this to happen in the next 10, 20 years in a way. So, so I think it, the, the, the the opportunities are so vast that sort of you know, it's almost like you know having the internet all of a sudden like what, what can you do with it and and we, we could we could see what we could do with it in the next few years but I think the really exciting applications will only begin to emerge in the next five to ten years um, but in the immediate term I think that there are sort of obvious things so certainly we would we will be able to now or we already have in a way uh, predict the structures of essentially every protein that we care about um, that will give us insights into their function potentially, right? Because as I said earlier, structure sort of determines function, or at least is related closely to function. Um, so this means that for many proteins, so you know, whose function we didn't know before, suddenly we have some idea, or we, we may begin to have a better idea. This is both useful for my biomedical applications, where you know that may give us something, some insight into the nature of say a disease. Um, but it's also potentially interesting for bio, for biomedical or say bioindustrial applications, bioengineering applications, where one is able to kind of mine protein databases for proteins that could be used in all sorts of interesting, say chemical, um, you know, uses or even uh, agricultural uses, for example. Um, and on, on the drug discovery side, there's some immediate applications in terms of uh, using these protein structures, these predictive structures to begin to uh, develop drugs that, that bind to them. Um, th this is by no means the kind of the entirety of the drug development process. But at least one key piece of the drug development process is being able to uh, selectively bind a single protein and modulate its function. And having those structures is critical for that purpose. And so this, this, this begins to allow us to do that in a much more systematic uh, way as well. So that, those are some of, some of the immediate kind of applications, but, but, there are, but there are many other ones actually as well. Okay, so if those are the immediate ones, uh, what, are the, what are the blue sky applications? What are the like, you know, 10, 20 years away versions or? Is that, is that too far away to speculate, is that? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I think I, I, there, are, there are probably stages. So, I mean, I think even on the, say, the five-year time frame, there, there are going to be applications like protein design where we, where we can potentially design new proteins that have uh, sort of bespoke function that, that we aim for, that we, that we intend, uh, for, intend for them to have. And, and, and that, I think, is going to be sort of a really explosive field in the next few years. Uh, it's already very much a, a sort of a very active and thriving field, but I think this, this breakthrough will allow us to, to go much further than that. Um, on the longer time horizon, say five to 10 years, I think what would be really interesting is, is going beyond structure to, to dynamics, to be to able to understand the motion of proteins, um, how they come together to form larger complexes and how those complexes essentially begin to carry, like, carry out cellular function, like I said, as a, as a molecular machine. Um, beyond that, then I, then I think you know, one begins to really think about cell simulations. Right? Can, we, can we take some of the principles that now we've sort of proven out in the context of individual molecules and begin to think about larger assemblies subcellular compartments and even entire cells and, and actually begin to, to simulate their behavior. And that, that I think would be a sort of the 10 to 20 time, 22 uh, year time horizon. That sounds like cool stuff. What, what could you, um, if you can simulate a cell, I mean, like, you know, one of the great scientific achievements, uh, you know, what, do you, what do you do with that? What, if you can, what happens, what can you do? What, yeah, basically what, can you do, what happens next? Right, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so certainly, I mean, there are, let's say, basic science questions, right? That, that will presumably give us much deeper insight into how cells work. I mean, I think, I think on a fundamental level, we don't really understand cells as computer programs. We, we don't really have a kind of a, a clear distillation of their, of their behavior as, as a, from the small to the large scale. And th that's just for, for pure science is, is very interesting. Um, but then there are many applications, right? So, so, I mean, there are many diseases that are essentially cellular diseases, including, including cancer, for example. So being able to understand how cells work and, and, and get dysregulated uh, will give insight into how, how to modulate their behavior in a way that, 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 that um, reverses disease or stop or, or at least uh, prevents disease. Um, synthetic biology is another application, right? If you're able to, to engineer cells and, and ration, if you understand how cells work, then you can begin to engineer them rationally to have new behaviors, for example, breaking down pollutants. Mm -hmm. I think that's so that wouldn't be possible today. Um, even, you know, looking maybe a little bit beyond the 20 year horizon, but even thinking about engineering plants, right? And, you know, so going beyond sort of 
what we today consider sort of genetically modified uh, you know, organisms, but, but really having a kind of much more rational way to potentially come up with all sorts of new organisms, all sorts of new fruits <laughs> or vegetables that, that we sort of can conceive of. Uh, even sort of in the kind of synthetic meat space, that could be really interesting coming up with ways you know, in vitro meat that, 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 that's sort of much more realistic and, and um, um, uh, that, that much more realistically emulates real meat. Um, and, and then there are also interesting uh, areas in sort of, you know, kind of like, you know, um, CAR T therapy, th things that have on the biomedical side where, where people are beginning to think about ways in sort of engineering cells as cargoes or delivery mechanisms of drugs, uh, again, in kind of very limited fashion today. But if we're actually able to simulate their behavior, that would give us the capability to engineer them in a kind of much more precise and ambitious way uh, that, that we could currently do. So, so it's, it's very much feels like, I, you know, the way I look at it is like, you know, when software was in the 80s and 70s, uh, I, you know, sort of it, building a new platform that's not, that's not sort of tied to silicon uh, substrates, but really kind of integrates very, very natively with, with the organisms, with the life. That's an interesting, yeah, interesting parallel that, um... Yeah, you know, essentially, if we're just working on proteins right now, but you know, we can then scale that up to larger systems as we're just like, oh, well, you know, let the let the compiler deal with that protein. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, okay, that's very cool. Um, so, you know, I mean, so maybe sort of coming back to these sort of uh, smaller time horizons. So, you know, potentially we're saying you know we can accelerate certain sort of processes such as you know drug discovery and that sort of thing, um, but. Uh, that means we can also accelerate maybe other processes that are sort of maybe um, less beneficial for the world. So I think, uh, like, what are the, what are the risks associated with this technology, um, or the, these new capabilities? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think if you had asked me this question a couple of weeks ago, I would have probably said, you know, it, it seems to be one of the the less dangerous sort of applications of ML. Uh, right. Although just a week ago too, I think there was this interesting paper, you know, a simple but clever idea where. Uh, that, that are these models that try to predict essentially the toxicity of a small molecule, and they typically use it in a way to optimize you know small molecules to behave in an untoxic fashion, uh, you know to be used as drugs. Uh, but, but you know it's not very hard. You know essentially you know you you, you reverse the gradient in the other direction, and instead of optimizing for uh, low toxicity, you optimize for high toxicity, and then no. you suddenly create some you know very dangerous drugs. And you know th th that particular paper sort of garnered a lot of a lot of attention. Um, Proteins being molecules, you know, have that same same property, right? So you, one could imagine sort of generating proteins that that um, that, that are toxic that have also sort of you know unintended intended or unintended consequences that could potentially be dangerous. Um, certainly, as one begins to to think about engineering organisms and, and things of that sort, which are potentially autonomous in various ways, uh, that's obviously going to, to to raise some very critical questions, right? I mean, and we, we'd have to not just think about them obviously in isolation. But in terms of the environment in which they exist and in, the, in which they, they interact with other 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 um, organisms, so it will be interesting. I mean, I suspect for the foreseeable future, much of sort of bioengineering and bio industry is going to be constrict, you know, restricted to sort of vats that are that are producing things in controlled environments. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get good enough at this to feel comfortable releasing these things in the wild. Um, but but still, there's been discussion about you know genetically modified mosquitoes that might you know might, might sort of help with you know various kind of uh, epidemics and such. So. Um, like any technology, I think I think I think it's certainly a double-edged sword, and, and particularly in the hands of people who are maybe not so um, uh, altruistic. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so, yeah. So, um, I think that sort of really sort of sort of sets the scene for like you know what's possible here, like. Um, but maybe let's talk a little bit about the sort of machine learning side of it. So, you know what. What are the what are the methods involved in the latest and greatest um, protein structure prediction methods? Like what what what's different these days? Yeah, so and I think that this is you know protein folding is, is instructive in that I think it's a it's a window into wider world that I think uh, is, is beginning to open, right? So so you know in the kind of the, the let's say the whatever the, the, the early 2010s to mid 2010s, the kind of first generations of deep learning methods. Uh, much of the focus there was, you know, was on these sort of canonical problems in computer science, things like computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition, things that people sort of recognize as, as critical, crucial problems for sort of kind of basic uh, elements of, of computer, computer cognition. Uh, but, 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 they were, but they were very much tied to these kind of, you know, like say kind of classical problems. What I think has happened in the last couple of years is, is that there's been sort of growing awareness that there are scientific problems uh, that are really interesting, right, and that, that, that have Tremendous, you know, benefit to society potentially, 
uh, and that, that could both benefit from machine learning, but also derive machine learning in sort of interesting new directions. And I think quitting polling is definitely one of those. Um, so, so, I mean, to your question about what's different about it, well, um, at a high level, right, what, what's different here is that you're trying to, at least in principle, um, not just have methods or architectures that are able to learn from data, uh, but that are also simultaneously able to reflect prior knowledge about what we, what we understand about these systems, right? And, and this, I think, is, is in some ways fundamentally different from, from things like human speech or, or vision or what have you, where we don't really have a sort of a strong theoretical understanding of the kind of underlying phenomena, right? If you're seeing, you know, images, I mean, images are just such a diverse type of modality. It's, it's, really, it's really hard to, to create a theory of, of, of images, right? Uh, but with things like proteins, you know, we actually do have pretty decent biophysical models of what these proteins, uh, how, of how these proteins behave. Um, in some ways, I would say maybe the disappointment if, if, for somebody who's looking in the space is that the, the kind of the leading the machine learning methods haven't used as much biophysics as one they would have thought is possible or could could be done. But nevertheless, they, they are certainly uh, they, they certainly have done so to some extent, right? So, so AlphaFold two, for example, has all sorts of elements in its architecture that um, you know captures aspects of, of if not protein physics then at least protein geometry um, and, and that that uh, is at least partly responsible for the fact that they work as well as they have right? so it's really kind of given machine learning in this new direction that that i think makes it much more makes it less about general learning and more about sort of being able to kind of maximally extract information out of well understood domains interesting so i was wondering if there's um maybe a slight parallel though you, you mentioned um say you know, computer vision like at least so the initial methods absolutely there were, there were no constraints like it was just you know here's an image and then very generic looking architecture to process it um but i guess more and more people are turning to simulation as a source of data um so i'm wondering if uh, potentially you know using simulation for inputs to vision systems has any parallels to the idea of like using sort of the knowledge of physics um, as applied to um, other systems, or is that not a parallel to draw? No, no, I think it's an excellent parallel to draw. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, well, <laughs> in some ways, it's, it's, you could argue it's already been applied to some degree with AlphaFold 2, because one of the ways in which AlphaFold 2 was trained was using, using sort of the self distillation procedure, where um, you know, essentially an, an early version of the model was used to make high confidence predictions. Uh, of certain proteins, and then that was used as data to kind of train the model. So it was, you know, data augmentation using sort of self self distillation, but that was already kind of a, 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 an inkling of what could be done with using these sort of approaches. Um, I think where where simulations will be, will be really exciting is actually on the dynamics question, right? So because we do have models, um, you know, and, and simulation methods that are effective at least for small proteins. Uh, to simulate their behavior over time, right? to simulate how they move, how they might interact with, with small molecules, for example. This is particularly important for drug discovery. Um, these are very expensive computations. So, so these are not things that you could sort of, kind of you know, turn the crank on. But nonetheless, um, it, it sort of it, it proposes a way to essentially turn compute into data. Right? And I think once you have that, that's a very, very powerful paradigm. Because if you couple these sort of expensive computations that are generating data in, 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 in silico data, but still data that's quite quite useful to then train a machine learning model that's potentially much more efficient in terms of doing service inference, uh, then you can have you can potentially have a sort of a, a really kind of virtuous loop right cycle that that sort of keeps driving this towards kind of ever higher heights in terms of its in terms of accuracy and and and, and quality of prediction. So uh, it hasn't happened yet. This is not something that, that that's really been kind of broadly applied or tried. There are there are significant challenges, but I but I think that is where the space will 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 move into the next few years. Okay. So, I mean, again, maybe on the theme of sort of the intersection of uh, science and machine learning, I mean, what are some other sort of uh, threads in this space that you're particularly interested in at the moment? There are many. So, I mean, certainly in kind of, let's say, in my backyard of, say, biochemistry, broadly speaking. Um, so, uh, yeah, within protein, there's protein structure prediction, but there are, but there are kind of uh, proximal problems, things like you know, the inference problem can you design proteins? Uh, can you predict interaction partners? Can you predict you know, things of like that sort? So related to proteins, um, but then you go a little bit further out to chemistry, and, and it gets very interesting right away because there the question then becomes: you know, can you predict, for example, the properties of different chemical compounds? Uh, can you predict the toxicity? Right, as we talked about earlier, can you predict whether they're going to modulate a protein? Are they going to bind it? Are they going to inhibit it? Are they going to, prom to promote its activity? Those are all really interesting questions. Um, lower down on, on the, sort of the quantum mechanical level, the, 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 there's been a lot of progress 
on essentially kind of speeding up quantum mechanical calculations. So, so those are calculations that are, again, based on sort of very well understood theory, but that are, you know, inordinately expensive to, 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 to do. Um, so it sort of limited the applicability of these kind of quantum mechanical systems to, you know, very, very simple, you know, atomic systems, you know, a handful of atoms or really even ha a handful of electrons. Um, but, but what machine learning has managed to do is, is sort of um, boost this so that one is able to, uh, to train models that, that are, that are as good as these very carefully constructed physical models, but that are orders of magnitude faster. Um, and, and so, so that, that's sort of, you know, that's, that's one, one example which I think will have um, tremendous applications, not just in, in, in sort of biomedicine, but even in things like designing, you know, small, um, sorry, designing new molecules for things like, um, you know, energy applications or, or new solar cells, or, you know, types of types of new, new chemistry, essentially kind of material science type of applications. That I think is, is, is really exciting um, as well. Um, and then beyond that, certainly not my areas of expertise, but I mean, there's been you know, quite, quite a bit of work in, in, in physics and in other areas. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, DeepMind actually, they published a paper on essentially controlling a you know, fusion reactor, um, you know, a small fusion reactor using, using sort of reinforcement learning techniques. Um, so my sense, I think this is true for DeepMind, but maybe perhaps even for the broader community as a whole, is that kind of how it's science is being increasingly seen as a really interesting place to go. Uh, both because the, the payoff is higher, but also because it sort of exercises machine learning in, in new ways. Um, and so I, I expect the trend to continue. That's, that's very exciting stuff. I mean, personally, when I hear things about this, I, I get a little bit more optimistic for the future and maybe, maybe in terms of climate and that sort of thing, where there's, there's maybe there's still a chance that we can tech our way out of this. Like, I, I know, what's, your, what's your view on that? Are we, are we going to, we're going to create some new organisms that, you know, eat up what we what we don't want and produce what we do. Like, like what, what, are the, what, are the, what are the, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it's very hard to predict, right? And, and partly because I think it's, so, so certainly it feels to me like we have the, 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 the building blocks to create technology that is potentially very transform transformative, right? For, for all these various problems, you know, climate, uh, disease, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, I mean, there are, there are challenges, right? Both sort of in terms of just kind of timing, right? so, you know, the, the speed at which the climate potentially is changing, but also more sociological problems, right? I mean, things like bioterrorism and so on, you know, where, where okay, you create new, new toxic materials that could then potentially be quite problematic, right? So it's a bit hard to say what, what, what will win. And I think it has as much to do with, with technology as it does with sort of, you know, the way we've arranged society, if you may. Um, and and th th that I think is, is, is sort of, again, like very unpredictable. But I, I do think in terms of, you know, if we were able to sort of marshal our resources in a kind of a fairly ideal way and, and kind of coordinate across, you know, across within and across countries, I suspect the technology certainly is there. I don't, I don't think that there's a kind of a problem that's not insurmountable given what we have and given what we know. Um, it's just more, more a matter of, of, of all the kind of the, of all the pieces falling in the right place at the right time. And, and that I think is, is hard to predict. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, do we have any, you know, is there any, um, do we have any measures? Like, are there any sort of like, concrete sort of observable effects of like um, machine learning applying to science? Like have we seen accelerations in certain scientific areas or is it still sort of at the like possibility excitement stage? I think so. I mean, I think it was at the possibility stage, you know, up to a year ago, year and a half ago. I, I think what we've seen now in multiple areas, but 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 I, I would certainly pick protein folding as maybe the, the, the kind of the clear shining example. Right? The, the, this is one area where it's a problem that's been a knot for decades, right? And, and I think would, it would have remained a knot for at least another decade or two. Uh, it, it, it's something that we thought maybe in, in 2040, we'd be able to kind of compute our way through it using kind of brute force. Um, but we saw this kind of massive acceleration, uh, you know, using, using machine learning. So, so I, I, this, I mean, you know, like I said, it's a break, breakthrough of the year. So the, clearly something kind of Nobel Prize worthy that, that was done. Um, and I, and I don't see any reason why this cannot be replicated in other areas. The stuff that I mentioned in infusion, those areas, again, not my area of expertise, but I think it's a bit more, say, early days. Um, but, but the ingredients, at least for the biochemical applications, are there, right? I mean, it has to do with, you know, with data. Um, it has to do with sort of, you know, having some understanding of the underlying, uh, like, second kind of biophysics um, and having the, the will to sort of, you know, build these models. So, so all of that is there, I suspect. Uh, so so I, I do think things proximal to this space. I mean, I, that, that I, I can say with, I think with certainty, we'll see, we'll see substantial improvement over the next 10 years. I think the field will look dramatically different, almost unrecognizably different uh, in 10 years from now. You know, the field be, being, you know, anything having to do with molecular biology and, and, and you know, sort of related areas uh, be, because, because this will just kind of percolate to all those various problems that haven't yet been solved, but we can just kind of see the answers now uh, given, given the breakthroughs in protein folding. 
Actually, maybe speaking of like, so some of those that maybe areas of problems where we haven't quite got the answers yet, but we can sort of see a path forward. What are the, um, what are, your, what are some of the most interesting like open problems still, like, you know, what, what can't we do, but the real, this is probably the next thing to work on. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, so one class is sort of other types of molecules. So it's like RNA, for example, you know, we, we know RNA takes on a few structure. Uh, we, we know it's functional. It also behaves a bit like proteins. In fact, we think that early life relied on RNA as it's sort of work, you know, as workhorse machinery. And it wasn't until later that proteins actually evolved. Uh, and 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 we we see we see evidence of that in our own in our own genomes where you know for example a ribosome is, is actually a kind of a riboprotein machine so it's comprised uh, comprises both RNA and, and proteins. Um, so being able to do the same thing for RNA as proteins will be will be very exciting. Uh, it's it's more challenging uh, in part because we understand a lot less uh, of, of, sort of RNA biophysics, but also because we have a lot less data. So while on the in the in the protein case we had maybe something like fifty thousand say unique protein structures. Uh, that, that were very crucial for, for training these models. Um, on RNA, it's probably more like a few hundreds. Uh, so, so it's a much more of a low data regime kind of, kind of task. Um, in the protein problem itself, there are really interesting questions that still remain kind of outside the preview of, of, of a fault. So, so one that's of sort of kind of immense biological uh, importance is the impact of genetic variation, right? So, so you know, we simply know that, that our bodies differ in terms of their um, proteins. Uh, we, we know, you know they're called coding regions, and those regions have, have genetic variations in them, both kind of just natural variation, but also sometimes somatic mutations that, are, that arise in, in the uh, course of life, and that could lead to disease. Uh, but we, but our fault can't yet, and, and none of the, really, the current methods can model how a mutation is going to impact the structure of a protein, not, not reliably anyway. Uh, okay. and that, that would be very useful, obviously, for, for biomedical applications. So that, that's sort of an obvious next step that I think a lot of people are interested in. Yeah. So when you say it, it um, struggles at that and momentum, what, what what is the what is the failure mode, or like why can't it get at that so, and the impact of a mutation? Yeah. So it it, it it has in part a little to do with how it actually works, how AlphaFold works, um, and, and and many of those methods, not just AlphaFold, but essentially a good chunk of the the field that relies on this idea. So so the idea is that you you're going to predict protein structure essentially by looking at what's called coevolution. So so you look at um, similar proteins to the one you're interested in, and you observe how different amino acids in those proteins co-evolve, how they change in concert with one another. Uh, but by doing that, you, you're able to essentially kind of infer um, correlations across evolutionary time that correspond to correlations in, in the 3D structure itself. And then there's that kind of mapping between evolutionists and 3D structure that, that allows one to predict these structures reliably. So the reason why I mentioned all this is because in the, con so, so the, the key kind of requirement to make, it, to make a reliable prediction is not only that you have the sequence of interest, but that you have many other sequences, all of which are related to it across sort of evolutionary time. Um, so in some sense, the predictions are, are like an average across all those various sequences. They're, they're kind of averaging, those, averaging this data to extract a single structure out. Um, so so you know, that might give a hint as to why the genetic variation thing doesn't work, because now if you have, a, if you have two sequences, which vary by a single amino acid, but that somehow suddenly have a very different structure as a result of that, that sort of is, is kind of, that falls to the cracks, right? That's outside the purview of the model because the model is essentially trying to kind of average away all these differences to get, to get at a common core. And, and so, so it's not sensitive to these kinds of changes that are really, um, that are really consequential, but they're consequential in a kind of very sensitive way. And you know, sort of a single change, just, you know, have a dramatic effect on the structure. It, it, it's, it, it tries to avoid in a way those kinds of signals and, and, and focuses on the, on the kind of common signals. So by construction, almost, it's not really suited for this task. Got it. Okay. So, I mean, can we view that as maybe like it's sort of, um, sort of too inclined to predict the usual and hasn't quite fully under, like, hasn't quite fully mapped out the full probability distribution of like the rare events or is it, is that, isn't that not a right parallel to draw there? It isn't, it isn't. It's, it, so it is partly about rare events. That's very true. I mean, many of these mutations are in fact quite rare. Um, but it's also, I would say it's sort of, a, it's, a, it's a kind of sampling of the space and a kind of mapping of the space that is not quite exactly the, the problem you want, right? So you're not, in, in truth, you're not really mapping from individual sequences to structure. You're mapping from kind of constellations of sequences to structure, right? So, so the, the kind of, the, 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 almost the, the framing of the problem is different, right? It's, it's, what we want is something that goes from a single sequence to the final structure. What we have 
is something that goes from a, a family of related proteins to the structure. That's fine in, most, in, in many applications, including like the ones we've been talking about, but specifically for the application in which you very much care about those kind of sensitive changes, this kind of breaks down because, because it's the single sequence becomes kind of the key, the key determinant of the structure. Got it. Okay. So and I've just got we've got a couple of questions coming in. So let me just take a look at some of these. So I have one from Jan. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, this might be a future looking question, but maybe there's a, a near time variety of it. So the question about, you know, could you could you write, uh, could these systems uh, potentially take into account all, you know, medical data that we might have about a particular person. So I, I think what we're getting at there is, you know, sort of personalized medication. Is that, is that something that's more opened up by this sort of technology looking forward? I think so. And, 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 I, and I think it's the kind of application that, it's one of those things that I, I talked about earlier. It, it's a, it sort of begins to point toward things that are maybe possible, but that we hadn't even sort of considered before because they just, so, they were so out of the realm of the possibility in a way. Uh, but I think it's, it's definitely an interesting idea to think about, all right, well, now that I have the kind of the, the full complement of human proteins, and I could, well, so, so again, you would need this, this bit I talked about. You would need to be able to not just look at the average structure, but you need to understand the specific sequence in an individual. But if you get to that, and I think we will get to that you know, soon enough, uh, I, I think we would have a much richer sort of representation uh, upon which to build kind of, uh, uh, upon which to build precision medicine, right? I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it's already being built on the kind of the genomic picture. And that's quite rich, but maybe it hasn't quite given us as many insights as we as we would like. Um, but, but I think the kind of the kind of the protein level is is yet another is yet another degree of sophistication that is much closer to things like disease. It's it's, it's not obviously quite the same thing. You still you still some distance away from that, but you're much closer to it than you would with just pure genetics. Uh, and and so I, I do think just purely from that perspective this will certainly have, have, have a, a positive impact. And, and, but, but it's early days, it's not, we're not there yet. And, and I think, you know, Alphafold obviously, I mean, it just became publicly available like four months ago. So it, it still remains very much kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a work in progress, but, but that's why I see things moving in the next few years, I think. Very good, because I think in the follow-up to their question, they uh, say, you know, could, could such a system even, you know, give it recommendations on what to eat or that sort of thing, which, you know, I'd, I'd certainly love if finally we could settle the debate about, you know, what diets are actually good. Um, but I imagine that might be, uh, that's going to take a, a little while, I would guess, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe that stuff is closer. But. Yeah, th that has probably less to do with the human genetics. I mean, at least I think at that level and probably more has to do with things like, you know, micro microbial, uh, micro microbiome and microbial sort of environment in, in one's guts. I think, um, I think this will help in that in that in that task because it, it sort of again gives us a better way to kind of reason about microbes than we had before um but but it's certainly yes i mean certainly a, a, a few steps to move because the things like nutrition and foods are you know a result of sort of interactions and and, and uh, phenomena that sort of is dependent on proteins but obviously kind of goes much much further down down in terms of the complexity ladder so so so, so that that i would say is still some time out okay uh, interesting uh yeah, the two word question here, but I think evocative certainly. The two words are longevity, proteins, question mark. Uh, so do you have anything to say on that in relation to all this? Well, so I mean, uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, this is not, this is not my area of expertise, but I, but I would say again, I mean, somewhat generic answers, but, but I, I will kind of try to customize into this question, which is uh, one, this will give us insights into, into protein function and behavior and therefore, um, ways in which aging may be sort of grounded in proteins. And at least in SOFA, I mean, it's, it's almost certainly the case that aging is grounded in many factors, but in SOFA it's grounded in proteins. This could potentially give us some insight into that. Right? So that, that, that I think would be useful uh, from, from, from that perspective, but it won't be the full picture to be sure, but it will be maybe part of the picture we didn't quite have uh, before. Um, the other aspect is, is more on the therapeutic angle, right? which is that uh, you know, if we're able to synthesize new proteins that have new functions, that could be could ultimately be a you know a powerful weapon in kind of the fight against aging. Right? So, so if, if we're you know if we if we begin to understand which proteins sort of become um, maybe less effective at their function over time in, in the human proteome, you know, can we supplement with sort of new proteins that that sort of you know that that, that cover for them that essentially kind of you know that that that, that try to fill in what, what these proteins have have uh, left gaps. Um, so, so it's in that sense, which I think this, this will potentially be useful, but, but this really is sort of at a very high level. It's certainly not something kind of very specific 
to the aging question. You could say this about any disease, essentially, or any, any kind of health problem, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got um, another question here. Um, so talking about um, quantum computing. So, so you mentioned that uh, you know, techniques like ML techniques are being used to uh, being applied to simulation of quantum mechanical systems. Um, maybe turning this around, it's uh, are you obviously I presume there is research into if we get quantum computing really going, how it could be applied to, for example, protein folding. Um, is that something that you follow? Do you have some thoughts to share on that? So quantum computing or quantum chemistry? Uh, so we've got computing here, but I'm interested in either. Yeah. So with, with with quantum computing, it's a little bit hard to say because, because there again, the, the algorithms are fairly limited because of what, what you can actually apply them to. Uh, the area where I think people have been excited, so, so there, there, there's actually a bit of subtlety here. So, so I said quantum chemistry, but, but even with quantum computing, there's the idea of being of saying, okay, can we actually simulate quantum, quantum mechanically systems using quantum computers, right? So essentially, essentially mapping the behavior of a quantum mechanical system using quantum computers, right? Um, that is a potential interest, certainly, for, for things like protein folding, or at least, say, protein small molecule interactions. Uh, but my sense of where quantum computing is and where it needs to be to be able to, you know, sort of a sufficiently high, large scale to actually inform this question, I think that's, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty, we're pretty far away from that. Um, but, but, but that would be, that would be the, the one area where I suspect um, the, so this class of problems could be useful, essentially, as quantum mechanical simulations, you know, quantum computing as simulations of nature. Um, so that, that's that's sort of one bucket. Um, the other thing I kind of I, I alluded to in the very beginning. So, so like I said, there's a lot of interest in using machine learning to, to do quantum chemistry better, uh, not quantum computing. And and there I think I think that is very very promising because I suspect um, for certain problems, particularly things like say interactions between small molecules and proteins, uh, where there are things that happen that are sort of difficult to model using classical approaches. For example, some molecules covalently bond to a, a protein. So, so they actually change the chemical structure of that protein. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things that are very, very difficult to do with what are called kind of classical methods that are very kind of cheap computationally, but they are not sensitive enough and not accurate enough to be able to capture that. Quantum chemical methods are, but they're very expensive. Uh, so if we're able to use machine learning to kind of speed up their, 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 their application, um, then they could potentially open up sort of new, new, new uh, opportunities in drug discovery alleys, certainly, and anything material science that are not possible today. Uh, so, 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 so that, that, that direction, I think, is, is much more immediately kind of um, applicable in still the next few years, I would say. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through the question. Actually, I mean, <laughs> this one may be uh, I don't know, a little bit off topic, but I mean, of general interest and maybe, I mean, I think maybe of interest to people like interested in the field. So someone just remarking that maybe traditionally biologists tend to use the programming language R more than maybe data science firmly entrenched in Python. Um, with ML being applied in this area, um, are your students switching languages or uh, um, basically people well-versed in Python and all the data science uh, ecosystem, could they come and work in uh, the application of, of uh, ML to biology these days? Or yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I would say, you know, my work and, and, and the, the, the field as a whole, the, the, let's say the, the kind of field of machine learning applied to, to bio, that's, that's been sort of Python native for a very long time. Uh, yeah, none of us really are sort of R people. Uh, the, the people who do rely on R, it's not untrue, are people who are generally doing kind of more statistical analysis. People coming from genetics, from population genomics, in you know, those areas where, 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 you know, they're not really doing machine learning per se, but they, they apply kind of quantitative and statistical methods to, to questions in, in, in biology. Um, Despite them both being kind of quantitative and say computer computer savvy, let's say that these are <laughs> kind of disjoint populations somehow, uh, for, for better or worse. Uh, there, there's maybe one kind of common <laughs> common subgroup, which is people who are doing kind of Bayesian, uh, you know, Bayesian onchromatic models. People mm -hmm. who are doing like, probabilistic programs who are maybe say trying to kind of model population structure, things of that sort, and who could maybe are maybe bilingual and kind of speak with, with both populations. Um, but at least people in kind of my space, people who are kind of thinking about, say, supervised machine learning, kind of classically apply, you know, deep learning, those kinds of things, um, um, we're, we're also, you know, Pythonistas, I would say. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm glad I asked. It's good just to get a feel for these things sometimes. Yes, yes, sure. okay. uh, all right. And I think uh, we're coming close to time. So, I mean, we've got four minutes left. Is there anything that, uh, is there anything that I haven't asked that you really want to like, let everyone know about in this area or? 
Well, one thing I will say, I mean, I kind of alluded to it, but I don't think I quite said it. Um, what I think is exciting about these problems, right, is that they, they are exercising machine learning in sort of new ways that I think maybe doesn't get exercised in, in like I said, computer vision and those other fields. So for example, you know, low data regimes, right? You know, I, I refer to problems where we have 100 data points or even 10 data points, right? Uh, where potentially one can can leverage a lot of prior knowledge, uh, but 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 fundamentally the kind of the specific problem is really very constrained on the data side. That's one area. Um, another is, is again kind of the prior knowledge, right? So this prior knowledge is not not simple. This is very structured knowledge. It's often has mathematical structure, especially in the case of molecules, where you think about you know kind of group theoretic constructions, you know things that between ideas from physics about the the kind of the symmetries that you see in space and things of that sort. So so on the whole, I think this opens up sort of new directions. For ML research that, that that are not sort of available or that are not necessarily maybe kind of leveraged or needed in kind of classical areas. And so, so if, you know, if you're an ML person and you're thinking about sort of interesting domains that are not just about taking the latest kind of you know network architecture, the sort of latest variant of the transformer and applying it to to your problem, but really something which kind of leverages and um, sort of deep expertise and, and, and sort of pushes the boundaries of what you could do with ML. I think I think sort of molecular molecular problems in general and, and bio ones in particular are, are a really good place to be. All right, we have, I think we can fit in one last question. And I've been picking this question because I don't understand it. So that's a nice deep one. So do you see ambiguous results for tertiary structure predictions owing to conform conformational changes in macromolecular structure? For example, NTP ASES or EGF receptor? Um, Yes, I mean that, that's definitely the case. I mean, and that's one good thing about Alphafold, right? Is that it, when it makes predictions, it predicts them. It gives you a confidence, right? It gives you sort of a, an uncertainty, um, you know, um, self-assessment of every residue of every region of the protein. And it, it's certainly been the case that the ones that are low confidence seem to be highly variable and and, and do undergo conformational changes. Um, I think what's challenging right now is that we don't quite, you know, we don't have a good way of of really. Um, characterizing the distribution of a kind of conformations that emerges from those from those predictions, and that's I think one other kind of key key next step is being able to kind of not just represent a single structure, but really a distribution of our structural ensembles or you know conformations. Right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, with that, I think we will hand over to the next speaker. So, with that, Mohammed, thank you very much for your time and fascinating. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you.